Welcome to On Strike, a production of Worker Strike Back. I'm Shama Sawant. And I'm Emily MacArthur. The hallmark of this year's American presidential election, and really working class consciousness as a whole, is the deep disgust the vast majority of working and young people feel at wealthy elites, the political establishment, and both the Democratic and Republican parties. Monday was the first day of the Republican National Convention, where we saw a spectacle of right populism in the wake of the assassination attempt against Trump. In Trump's first election, he claimed he would stand up for the forgotten men and women. In office, he did nothing of the sort, of course, and carried out massive tax cuts for the rich and super rich, but vicious attacks on working class people, immigrant community members, and social services. This RNC featured an unprecedented speech by Teamsters President Sean O'Brien, which will be the main focus of our show today. O'Brien represents 1.2 million rank-and-file workers, 300,000 of whom are employed at UPS. The Teamsters are also playing a major role in the fight to unionize Amazon. Notably, the RNC also saw a speech by a far lesser known union leader named Robert Bartels, who said he and other fellow union members had always voted Democrat, but that, quote, we have come to expect empty promises from Democratic politicians, end quote. The right populism of Trump and this rebranded Republican Party included putting the words everyday Americans in giant font behind the podium at the RNC. This is a con job, of course. The Republican Party and Trump in no way represent the interests of everyday Americans. But it gets an echo because of the ongoing betrayals and attacks on workers by the Democratic Party, which is also a party of the bosses. The Democrats are in total crisis. In the wake of President Joe Biden's disastrous debate performance, high-profile Democratic Party figures like George Clooney, Democrat congressional representatives, and many others said Biden needs to step aside and make way for a much more viable candidate who could defeat Donald Trump. It has certainly been clear that the vast majority of ordinary Americans have thought for a while that Biden is not a viable candidate. This anointing of a candidate who can barely put a sentence together, not to mention his warmongering and ongoing betrayals of working class people, is creating more openings than ever for the dangerous rise of Trumpism and right-wing populism. Biden has publicized supposed new promises, including a 5% cap on rent increases, but they ring hollow with many asking, why wait to do these things? You're president now, why don't you do it now? <laughs> and why would we trust you when you broke all your earlier promises? Exactly. With working people angry at the establishment as a whole and in the absence of a mass working class and anti-war alternative, Trump's return to the White House is looking more and more likely. The latest and perhaps the starkest illustration of the confusions from and grave dangers of right-wing populism is this speech by Sean O'Brien, the president of the International Brotherhood of the Teamsters, on the first day of the Republican National Convention. If you are watching this and the idea of a labor union leader speaking at a Republican convention, much less at an event headlined by Donald Trump, strikes you as insane, well, you're not wrong. And if you haven't watched O'Brien's speech, you haven't seen anything yet. Workers being sold out to big banks, big tech, corporates and the elite. And I'm not the only one who sees this. Everyday families see it. The American people aren't stupid. They know the system is broken. We all know how Washington is run. Working people have no chance of winning this fight. In 2021, Teamsters nationwide elected me to fight for them, and that's precisely what I'm doing. Something is wrong in this country, and we need to say it out loud. I will always speak for America and the American worker, both union and non-union. But O'Brien said this at a convention bankrolled by billionaires investing in a campaign that is going to do their bidding if elected. Billionaires like Elon Musk, who recently publicly endorsed Trump and pledged tens of millions of dollars for Trump-supporting super PACs, and Carol Tomei, the CEO of UPS, who gave $36,500 to the National Republican Senatorial Committee in 2022. So why would O'Brien's speech sound credible to anyone? Well, precisely because the Democratic Convention will also be bankrolled by billionaires investing in a campaign that is going to do their bidding if elected. That is the tragic situation America's working people are caught up in. Both the Democrats and Republicans are warmongering parties serving the interests of the billionaire class and of U.S. imperialism. 
But we cannot afford to fall for O'Brien's attempts to sell us Trumpism. Trump, the Republicans, and the right wing are thoroughly anti-worker, and they have an ominous agenda that is anti-immigrant, misogynistic, racist, and homophobic. But nor can we believe in the message from most of the rest of the labor leadership who are tied to the Democrats and stumping for Biden. Working people need our own party, and we need to get actively organized right now to fight for our interests, including by building for mass protests in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention. We'll explain why and how in this episode, in which we will present a working class response to this deceptive speech by Sean O'Brien. This is something you simply won't find anywhere in the corporate media, and that's why, before we continue, I want to remind you to like this video and subscribe to our channel. If you've been watching On Strike, you know that the analysis we bring is unique. Become a member of Worker Strike Back to help ensure we can continue to build our movement against the bosses and their political servants, and so that On Strike can continue to bring the kind of discussions about strategy needed to fight back and win. We don't run any ads, we don't accept corporate money, and we rely entirely on donations from working people. We're now just a month away from the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, where Worker Strike Back is helping to organize protests to demand an end to the genocidal war on Gaza and for an alternative to Biden and Trump and these two warmongering parties of the billionaires. We will be holding a rally there where we will be joined by independent left anti-war pro-worker presidential candidate Jill Stein, who has taken a consistent stand against the war. If you support building these protests at the DNC and want to help our movement against the bosses and their political servants, please donate now. Go to workerstrikeback.org and click on donate. And please join us this Sunday, July 21st, for Worker Strike Back's First National Zoom Conference. Jill Stein, Nick Cruz of the Revolutionary Blackout Network, and I will speak about how we can use these next months to build the movement against the bosses and against the war on Gaza. Please register now on workerstrikeback.org for this conference. In the second part of the July 21st Zoom conference, we'll be having a discussion on what position Worker Strike Back should take in this election and how we can build our movement and on whether to endorse Jill Stein. Everyone who attends can speak at the Zoom meeting, but to vote, you need to become a member. Sign up to become a member of Worker Strike Back now. Emily, how stunning was this to see a Teamster president, a labor union leader speak at a Republican national convention? It was shocking. Uh, you know, it's one thing to sort of be an outsider, um, but how could you possibly buy that Trump is in any way an outsider, given that his backers are billionaires? Exactly. And this is not some new person to the labor movement. This is a seasoned, longstanding union leader. So it is pretty shocking. And all the praising that Sean O'Brien did of Trump, I mean, it's just shocking. Comes across like a fanboy. Yeah. President Trump! had the backbone to open the doors to this Republican convention, and that's unprecedented. No other nominee in the race would have invited the Teamsters into this arena. Now, you can have whatever opinion you want, but one thing is clear. President Trump is a candidate who is not afraid of hearing from new, loud, and often critical voices. And I think we all can agree, whether people like him or they don't like him, in light of what happened to him on Saturday, he has proven to be one tough SOB. It's not like Sean O'Brien or working people don't know what they're getting from Trump, right? We, we have an example. We have four years, uh, and it's a litany of attacks on working class people. Exactly. He issued these famous or infamous Trump tax cuts, which were uh, massive trillions of dollars of handouts for the billionaire class, which obviously came at the massive expense of ordinary people. And then he also appointed, you know, the person he appointed to head up the National Labor Relations Board, which is supposed to be this entity that um, sort of adjudicates labor disputes between bosses and workers. Trump's appointee for that position was this guy named Peter Robb, who was actually the lead attorney 
in helping Reagan in 1980 in destroying the air traffic controller strike. Well, I mean, later in the speech, Sean O'Brien even somehow makes it a good thing, yeah. even though it's absolutely a shameful exactly, record that the yeah. Teamsters would have endorsed Reagan. Like, that's that's nothing to be proud of no. uh, or like a banner to hold up. And I mean, I think you were talking about the NLRB, right? Um, and also Trump's NLRB decided the urgent thing to do during the COVID pandemic was to suspend all union elections, you know, which is nothing but like a shield for the bosses, right, to say, in these unprecedented conditions where workers are organizing for PPE, organizing for better wages because they're essential workers, you can't vote for a union? Exactly. And who can forget the days of the shutdown, the federal government shutdown, when, according to Trump, hundreds of thousands of federal public sector workers were supposed to take mandatory furloughs and maybe even be laid off. And we remember how, in reality, the shutdown was ended because of rank-and-file union members including led by Sarah Nelson, the leader of the flight attendants union, that really forced Trump's hand to end the shutdown. And the whole way he talked about it, it was as though taking pleasure in putting these public sector workers out of work, which, I mean, of course, is a longstanding Republican talking point as though public sector workers are somehow like leeches on society rather than being what they are, which is like essential to helping like society move and help services happen for ordinary people. And yeah, so, so it's like pleasure in the government shutdown, which negatively impacted hundreds of thousands of workers and millions of working people. Exactly. And as you said, Emily, there's be, just been a series of attacks and also attempted attacks, you know, things that he didn't get away with primarily because working people, including union members, pushed back against him. So these were uh, attacks that he wanted to do against Medicare, against Social Security, and against many other social services. And then also remember the Muslim travel ban that he put in place. And you and I were at the SeaTac airport shutdown where we successfully led socialists like you and me. We led uh, a massive shutdown by thousands of working people. And it was that kind of action that forced Trump to pull back from many of his extreme policies, especially against immigrants, against uh, working people as a whole. Right, and that's the legacy that this speech attempts to paper over. Exactly. Now, when I won the presidency of the team since in a national election two and a half years ago, we started reaching across the aisle. In the past, the Teamsters have endorsed GOB candidates, including Nixon, Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. But over the last 40 years, the Republican Party has really pursued strong relationships with organized labor. There are some in the party who stand in active opposition to labor unions. This, too, must change. So Sean O'Brien is talking about how the composition of the Re Republican Party is anti-worker, which, I mean, he's correct. And then he says, this too must change, but how, right? Uh, and I think rather than leaning on the legacy of the Teamsters endorsing terrible anti-worker candidates like Reagan and George W. Bush, he should be leaning on the radical history of the Teamsters, right? Um, you know, the, the fighting history of tens of thousands of workers who had to fight the bosses and the political establishment to even win their union in the first place. Um, I mean, I know we've talked about 1934 many, many times, uh, you know, fights that were led by socialists, but inside the Teamsters union. And to even win beyond just the union, win a strong contract that involved class struggle tactics in the workplace, in the streets, and in the courts, you know, fighting the political establishment that he's talking about. That's how we change the position of those in power. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I, was, when I first watched this speech, as somebody who's been a rank and file union member and as a socialist like you, Emily, it's just, it was just, um, just bizarre for me to watch a Teamster leader extol that actually shameful history of labor leadership endorsing right-wing Republicans and not calling upon the rich and proud history of the strikes, including the general strikes in uh, cities like Minneapolis in the 1930s, which actually ushered in a whole period of labor, labor rights organizing and real a militant fighting movement and really with uh, with revolutionary socialists leading the way. Can you imagine the, the contrast between 
what we saw on display at the RNC from Sean O'Brien and the actual history of the Teamster Union, and especially to bring up Reagan. And I mean, if, if my union had endorsed Reagan, that is not something that I would bring up as a proud thing. I would bring that up as a cautionary tale. It's a watermark for the yes, crushing of exactly. the labor movement in this country. Exactly. I mean, yes, exactly. Reagan in the U.S. and Thatcher in the U.K., I mean, they were the figureheads of the turning point, like you said, of the period where it ushered in nearly 40 years of relentless and brutal attacks against the union movement internationally, against working people and the poor internationally. It's uh, it's just shameful to bring that up. And as far as Nixon is concerned, and we've talked about this on this show, is actually a lot of radical things happened in the Nixon era. As we know, the Vietnam War was ended, Roe v. Wade was passed. Many other rights, including black rights, Native American rights, were achieved. But that was precisely because, as you were saying earlier, it was from hundreds of thousands, millions of American working people on the streets shutting down their workplaces. So in reality, the record of Nixon is that despite him being this reactionary anti-worker White House figure, we were able to win these victories because working people fought back. Right. And I mean, as a labor leader, what is your role if not to point to the role that your union members can play in fighting for those things and not to just treat them as cogs in the machines of the billionaires? Exactly. And look at uh, the fact that O'Brien himself actually, unfortunately, you know, if you if you if you hear a speech about why the teamster did not endorse Biden, he talks about how uh, under Biden, a company named Yellow Freight went into bankruptcy. And obviously, this is relevant to the Teamsters because 30,000 workers. 30, yeah, workers lost their jobs. Obviously, really, uh, really unjust for working people to lose their jobs because the bosses don't manage their companies properly. However, what we want is labor leaders who will call for democratic public ownership of companies that are failing under the leadership of these so-called entrepreneurs and these brilliant people who are supposed, you know, the billionaires who are supposed to have all the brains and uh, run the economy. And but what they're really doing is running the economy to the ground. And we saw we've seen it again and again through the Great Recession and other periods in the history of capitalism. So this was another of those examples where the company didn't succeed. But rather than calling for public ownership by the workers of the company, uh, this guy is complaining that the corporate ownership of this company wasn't restored by the Biden regime. And, you know, as a tale as old as time, as we saw uh, under uh, Obama when he bailed out the banks, uh, actually, the American people owned a pretty hefty share of this company. They'd given a $700 million loan um, to prop up uh, Yellow Freight, um, which it seems like in the bankruptcy, they're likely not to have to repay. So, I mean, it, the question was already posed, right? We've already invested. We've already, yeah, working people <laughs> have already put in money. Not to mention, I mean, both the, uh, the working people who paid in, in their tax revenue for this company, but also the workers themselves at Yellow, Yellow Freight. And I mean, what's also unfortunate about that whole affair is there's, there is a kernel of positivity in the question of holding elected officials accountable, right? To say, you didn't stand up for workers and that's why we're not mm -hmm. going to endorse you again. But to then turn around and speak at the RNC in these glowing terms about Trump, it just doesn't fly. Exactly. And I think the other reason why this is so stunning that this is the reason that that Sean O'Brien used to not endorse Biden is the fact that if you're a labor leader, what is, I mean, Biden broke all his promises to working people. So, you, you know, take your pick. Yeah. However, if you are a leader in the labor movement, what is the first example that you would use in order to talk about how Biden sold out workers? I mean, we've talked about it many times, but the rail strike, which Biden colluded to exactly. crush. Exactly. And it's in not only remarkable that Sean O'Brien didn't bring that up as at least an example of a reason why workers shouldn't endorse Biden, but in fact, far from standing up to Biden, O'Brien went after his members for union members, the rank and file members for criticizing it, and in fact gave cover to Biden for the sellout of the railroad workers. And this is relevant because about half of you know the railroad workers, as we know, are you know as they are they're parts of different unions, 
the railroad workers as a whole, and half of those railroad workers are in unions that fall under the leadership of the Teamsters. So it's very relevant. And not only did Sean O'Brien end up giving Biden cover to sell out the railroad workers and block their strike, he actually, in his speech at the RNC on Monday, he ended up praising Republican senators, including uh, Senator Josh Hawley, for standing with the railroad workers. As a negotiator, I know that no window or door should ever be permanently shut. In my administration, the Teamsters reached out to eight Republican senators who stood up for railroad Teamsters over our fight for paid sick leave. Josh Hawley was one of them. And uh, I'm not sure how many of our viewers remember what happened in 2022 when the railroad workers were sold out, and we've certainly talked about it on this show. But the fact is that because even the progressive Democrats, even the squad like AOC, because they didn't stand with railroad workers, it created an opening for the mega Republicans, a, a few, you know, a handful of them, to vote in favor of the railroad worker strike against the blocking of it because it was meaningless. Right. It was symbolic, but they could, they could, you know, it was a very easy opportunity for them to give the completely false appearance of being pro-worker when it didn't, when their votes weren't going to stop the attacks on the railroad workers at all. I mean, and you kind of called this situation right at the time you put out an op-ed and uh, it made a lot of really important points. Uh, uh, but you said a socialist can't be a strike breaker. Um, and if they are, that they should be expelled from the organization that they're part of. Um, and like, this is just a, an actual quote from, from your op-ed. You say, the danger inherent in this sellout beyond the obvious quality of life damage to the rail workers themselves is that it will drive working people into the arms of the right wing who can posture as the working class political alternative to the Democrats. I mean, that's like, uh, I guess, uh, foresight over astonishment. Exactly. And that's always better for the working class, which is why I think it's important for working people to watch this show because we present an analysis that you're never going to say, see anywhere else. And as you said, rather than be reactive, we it's important for us to study why it is it is crucial that we build independent worker strength. And this is an incredible story of how workers were sold out by not only by the corporate Democrats, but by progressive Democrats. And, you know, for the most part, except for people like Bernie Sanders and Rashida Tlaib, who's a member of the squad, for the most part, the progressive Democrats and the squad completely sold out the railroad workers and did their own type of con job, you know, where they, they where they voted for one legislation and, and voted against another legislation to pretend like they're on the side of railroad workers. And, and in that time, uh, you know, socialists, yourself um, uh, and, and you. myself as well. Um, and I think Logan, who we've had on this show a number of times, uh, we're working closely with uh, groups like Railroad Workers United and other sort of individuals who opposed this rotten contract. And when they saw that sellout by so-called self-identified progressives, they were gutted. I mean, it just sort of felt like this is so big, um, you know, and to see that there was a rank and file struggle that was prepared to go out, to go out on strike, to fight for a strong contract. And instead, they were knifed in the back by the very figures who claim to, you know, represent them. It exactly. just was gutting. It was. And it was a turning point because not only were the railroad workers completely betrayed, but I was actually surprised at a time, and I continue to be surprised at how many working people who are not railroad workers, who are not even in unions, who knew about that sellout by Biden and the Democrats. Well, and it felt really relevant because very shortly after that, there was the really deadly crash in East Palestine. And so it just became really inherently connected that the working conditions of those very rail workers who were trying to get time off and like reasonable pay and health care, um, you know, that not getting those things led to dangerous conditions and that, you know, the rail bosses were pocketing profits, but not investing in, you know, sort of better infrastructure and the materials that the trains were made Absolutely, out of. Absolutely, yeah. And working people, again, pay the price. Exactly. And both the railroad workers themselves with their own lives and the con working conditions they face, but and also the working class people in East Palestine, ordinary people in East Palestine who have paid the price. And, you know, it's in, important also to mention that they, the, the people who actually own these railroads, all these corporations, these are these 
big corporations that are owned by arch billionaires like Warren Buffett who donate to the Democratic Party. Mm. So it's all like it's all just one big um, slush fund. Slush fund. <laughs> yes. I could not have said it better. <laughs> And I'm glad you made the point that it is important for people to watch this broadcast, you know, not just because we think it's good, but because in comparison to what other commentators have said, I mean, you know, we sort of have gone to battle with a couple of them, uh, including Ryan Grimm and other figures who provided cover for the squad um, as though they had some grand strategy. We didn't get to know what it was, but, you know, as though oh, they're just trust them to trust, trust, trust the experts. Which has always yeah, worked out I mean, well for yeah, us. I, I'll never forget. Yeah. I was on uh, Brianna Joy Gray's podcast, Bad Faith, and she had invited Ryan Grimm, who was totally running cover for the Democrats. And uh, it was such an atrocious and false position that it actually made me swear <laughs> on, on camera, which I don't usually do. It was a betrayal. Sorry, what the actual fuck? Are, are you saying that those of us who are standing up for workers, we have the responsibility, you have the responsibility. Yes, you have to find a worker, Ryan. one worker. You have the they have to justify why it is that they voted to break a strike knowing that they literally had zero to gain from it. The, the workers felt they had something to gain from it. Maybe the workers don't want to be part of this fantasy play. Like. The, the workers what like actually play? Play. What are you so, to get sorry, rid of the I'm Railway sorry. Labor Act. It, it was just astounding to me that somebody could claim that a breaking of a strike was not a breaking of a strike. And the most um, the most shocking aspect of what people like Ryan Grimm were saying was that the workers themselves wanted this supposed strategy, which ended up selling them out. Like, so what are we supposed to believe? That workers are complete idiots and we don't know, working class people don't know what's in their interest and what's what's a, what's a knife in the back? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Like, who doesn't want a day off yeah, from work? Exactly. And, and look, at, look at the endless list of public figures, organizational leaders, commentators and analysts, you know, just endlessly telling us that, telling working people that we should trust the Democrats. After all these betrayals, we should trust the Democrats uh, because of, uh, you know, holding up the specter of Trump, but never telling us the truth, which is that Trumpism has got an opening precisely because of the betrayals by the Democrats. So it's not only labor leaders, it's NGO leaders. It's the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America leaders. It's commentators and analysts and uh, Bernie Sanders, AOC, now not only shilling for the Democrats, but for Biden specifically, other progressive Congress members like Pramila Jaipal, all of us telling us we're supposed to believe that something good is going to come out of supporting the Democrats. And have actually had real credibility, which of course AOC did. She, she beat this conservative incumbent. She stood up against Trump and his deplorable, um, you know, situation at the border, uh, called for things like a Green New Deal that we urgently need. I mean, the climate catastrophe is worse every day. And they squandered it. They sold it out. And now they have no credibility. So, yeah, it's, it's the writing exactly. on the wall to go and, to and, the right and way. It's also, you know, it's the, the way they do it, too, it's, it's in order to pull the wool over the eyes of working people. So, in one breath, AOC goes and says the matter is closed, Biden is the candidate. In the next breath, she goes and files articles of impeachment against the Supreme Court judges, as if that's going to do anything that's going to be helpful. But it's all just performative. Yeah, and it does, I mean, comes back to, I think, a, a weakness that we do see, unfortunately, in a lot of the labor leadership, which is that they accept the logic of capitalism, you know, and so that forces them to say, we want these companies to succeed and we need to share the profits um, and that kind of like those talking points, which extols these companies and extols America first. Um, uh, but that isn't going to ever be a logic that works out, that arithmetic does not work out for working class people. Um, and it is, I think, something like we need to be building the socialist uh, layer of the labor movement who's able to draw these things out as we are seeing just like an ongoing spiral of the economy because those things are going to become more and more dire. We are going to see more and more companies failing over the next few years because the math is not adding up. There are many companies like Yellow Freight who have tons of debt on the books that are, you know, these so-called zombie companies that right. just like are persisting on cheap loans and increasingly with, you know, the Fed raising interest rates, those cheap loans are not available. So they can't just kind of continue to debt buy their way out. And even when these companies fail, the the owners of 
these companies, the wealthy, they never pay a price. They always go away with a golden parachute or something akin to that. They probably already have millions of dollars invested in stock options, maybe somewhere in the Cayman Islands. They're going to be just fine. Who loses out? It's the workers who lose their jobs. And just to be clear, I mean, we do not think that union leaders or unions in general should be endorsing Biden. Um, you know, as we've talked about in other episodes, we uh, worker strike back members are organizing in their own unions to call on their unions to rescind what are largely undemocratic uh, endorsements uh, that have been pushed through for Biden. Um, exactly. But we don't see Trump as an alternative. Absolutely. And in fact, we are, what we're seeing now, you know, the working people being disgusted with Biden and then turning towards Trump, hope, hope hoping that he would be somebody who would stand up for them. It's actually just history playing itself again and again and again, right? I mean, we talked about the Reagan endorsement by the Teamsters. That came in the context of the president before Reagan, who was a Democrat, you know, Jimmy Carter. Have you seen people want him to run again? Yes, I've seen that. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Democrats are in so such deep crisis that they're now going back to Jimmy Carter. But Jimmy Carter, who... You know, uh, I'm sure you can make an argument about who was less anti-worker or who was less reactionary, but... It would be a terrible graph. <laughs> yeah, but it would be a terrible graph, and exactly. And, and so the it's important to, uh, uh, for our viewers to know that the endorsement of Reagan by the Teamsters, which we completely disagree with, obviously we weren't there then, but, you know, we completely disagree with, is, uh, is something that happened because Carter had sold out many of the workers that were represented by Teamsters or workers in the same industry who may not have been unionized. Uh, it was actually something called the Motor Carrier Act, which was a huge attack on many of the workers in that industry. And so rather than do what we have been advocating for so strenuously in Workers Strike Back, which is for the labor movement to get organized and build an independent alternative, a real political organization, a labor party, a working class party to represent working people rather than advocate for something like that. The, you see labor leaders getting yo-yoed between Democrats and Republicans. When Democrats sell out, you go to the Republicans. When Republicans sell out, you go to Democrats. And in fact, the same thing is true for the air traffic controllers as well. You know, we just talked about PATCO, the union that represented the air traffic controllers, who ended up endorsing Reagan. And then, of course, Reagan got their endorsement. And then one of the first things he did as president was completely crush the air traffic controller strike and literally drove them all out of the job. And they were very clear. Reagan was very clear that this was not just about the air traffic controllers. He was sending a signal. He and the U.S. ruling class as a whole, in fact, internationally, the ruling class, uh, Western ruling class, was sending a powerful message to the labor movement that this is going to be an era of just unprecedented attacks against the rights of working people. But that also, the PATCO endorsement of Reagan also came in the wake of them feeling sold out by Jimmy Carter. It's the logic of lesser evilism, exactly. right? It's just, it doesn't leave space, the logic, uh, in order to actually build something new that fights for the things that we actually need and we want. I mean, there was an effort, right, in the 90s to build a labor party that, I mean, we could probably have a whole episode about that fighting history, but to have taking the logic of endorsing an openly neoliberal candidate like Reagan, just it, it, it's a prison uh, to be within the logic it's a of lesser Yes, Yes, it's, it's a prison, exactly. And it's a prison that working people are stuck in because there isn't any leadership on the left to take them in the direction of independent organizing. You know, because the fact that there isn't any independent political alternative for the working class is not happening because there's a shortage of desire or hunger among the rank and file, right? I mean, working people, millions of people are fed up with the establishment as a whole. And there is a huge opening for doing something like this. But what you see is, that, you know, you see labor leaders either shilling for Democrats or then shilling for Republicans. I mean, that, what is it, $45,000 donation to each um, party of the bosses, that would go a long way towards building an actual effort for working class people, an actual party. Um, you know, that's that's venues, that's, um, you know, backing up candidates and helping support, like, actual organizing. And beyond the $45,000 that you were talking about, what about the $215 million that... Un the union movement as a whole spent on the Biden campaign in 2020. And remember, that was the whole story was that Biden was going to be the most pro-labor president 
ever. And in fact, they still talk about. They still say it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, where is this money coming from? Right, two hundred fifty million dollars from ordinary working people, from union members, from the rank and file of the union movement, and this is on the basis that the labor leadership, uh, you know, the big section of the labor leadership, bringing this illusion to union members and also to the working class as a whole that this guy is your friend and you should give your hard-earned money to his campaign because he's going to stand up for you. You know, so those $250 million were from working class people who gave their own money because they felt that somebody is going to do something for them. And then what did this most pro-labor president do? As we said, he broke the railroad workers' strike. Remember his promise to pass $15 an hour as the federal minimum wage? What happened to that? Dead on arrival. Exactly. And then he also famously proclaimed that he was not going to entertain any effort towards Medicare for all. I mean, he said it so proudly, like, you know, Medicare for all. Um, in his famous debate performance, he did say, we beat Medicare. I know. And, you know, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because this whole crisis in the Democratic Party where they have a candidate who is barely able to put a sentence together and yet they are unable to find anyone. I mean, you know, they're in, a, in such a logjam, in such paralysis that they don't have another candidate who can come forward. But we covered in uh, one of our previous episodes that even if they did have somebody else come in as a substitute for Biden, like someone like Kamala Harris, who's the current vice president, or Gavin Newsom, all of these people have their own anti-worker and pro-big business track records. And at the end of the day, each of these people is going to stand up for the overall agenda of the Democratic Party, which is pro-big business, anti-worker, and Really, the question that we should be asking ourselves and viewers, you know, we should all be asking ourselves this question. Why is it that a labor leader like Sean O'Brien ended up going to the Republican National Convention to give what is arguably the most pro-worker speech, but in a very disingenuous way, you know? And it's undoubtedly a more pro-worker speech than we'll hear from anyone of the DNC. Of course, we'll be yeah. outside protesting um, uh, for that. And we will be being pro-worker speeches. At Absolutely. The, at the I mean, you're speaking. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think uh, there's, there's this utter hollowness and betrayal, not just from Biden, but even from the so-called left of the Democratic Party, exactly. right? The, the sort of great hope that we saw in 20. 19 uh, was, you know, AOC, Bernie, uh, the like rise of these sort of upstarts who are challenging the Democratic Party establishment. But where is that? And even calling them socialists. Yeah, I guess I can't even bring myself to say it. Um, but like, where where is that project now? Absolutely riding the flank of uh, actually protecting Biden. They're not even the ones who are coming out no. saying to replace In Biden. Fact, that's what's stunning about this period that you have someone like George Clooney, who is not a radical by any measure, you know, very much entrenched in the establishment, coming out publicly and saying Biden needs to go. And then you have Bernie Sanders defending, you know, absolutely staunchly defending Biden as the Democratic candidate. But I think most importantly now, this is not a beauty contest. It's not a Grammy Award contest. It is a contest for who stands with the vast majority of the people in this country, the elderly, the children, working class, the poor. And that candidate is obviously Joe Biden. And then you had AOC, who famously declared the matter is closed. Biden is the candidate. He made clear then, and he has made clear since, that he is in this race. The matter is closed. I mean, my own parent union, the AFL-CIO, also put out a very similar statement saying we stand fully behind Biden uh, and yeah. Harris. Um, and there's just no leadership no. coming and from fact, the Sarah left. Sarah Nelson, yeah, Sarah Nelson, who led the really courageous effort in fighting the Trump uh, federal government shutdown, where she said that if this federal, uh, if the shutdown continues, workers are going to go on strike. She just issued a statement saying that Biden is the candidate and she is behind him. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just political wilderness that is presented to ordinary people. I mean, I'm really glad you brought up Sarah Nelson because I think she has played this really heroic role. I mean, uh, how many other just like iconic women union leaders could you name off the top of your head? Um, you know, and she also says pretty radical things in terms of that working class people do need our own party. Like she says those kinds of things, but then she sort of kicks that football down the road, right? She says, yeah, we need that and we need to be organizing in our workplaces to get there. 
but then also right now what we need to do is get behind Biden. And that's an absolutely like uh, an abdication of leadership of like what a union leader should be doing at this moment where it is clear that neither option represents the needs of working class people. Exactly. What progressive labor leaders should be doing actually is putting forward the question of a new party for working people. But instead, you see Sean Fain, who obviously played an important role in leading the UAW strike last year. And of course, we have our analysis. We have presented our analysis of the UAW stand-up strike on this uh, show many times, where it, it was a very strong strike and it won historic victories. However, we also believe that uh, it, you know we need all-out strikes. But then after that, what happened, as we know, is the, the UAW, under Sean Fain's leadership, passed a public uh, resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. So it took a really important anti-war position, and many unions have done so. But then many of these unions, including UAW, turn around and endorse Biden, who's the warmonger-in-chief. And the point that you were making about how uh, Sarah Nelson, you know, who's who's one of the more progressive leaders and has played a really important, courageous role in the labor movement, uh, they present this point as if it doesn't matter, you know, if there's a, it doesn't matter if it's a Democrats or Republicans. It's it's about the working class. We need to recognize that we are the working class. And it is not about Democrats or Republicans or our own political party. It is about the shop floor. It is about the workplace. It is about attacking capitalism where it exists. And then we will have a working class party because all of the politicians will respond to us. You had Sean O'Brien yesterday give his own flavoring of that talking point. Something like, it doesn't matter if you have an R. I don't care if you have an R on your name or a D on your name. At the end of the day, the Teamsters are not interested if you have a D, R, or an I next to your name. We want to know one thing. What are you doing to help American workers? He also said, or an I. Or an I, yes, he did. Um, meaning independent. Um, but these points, are, these talking points are very misleading because... It is lulling working people into thinking, it doesn't matter which party is in power, we can keep fighting for our needs. But the reality is that the fight, the fight back in the labor movement is actually tremendously stymied by the fact that the leadership is tied at the hip to the Democratic Party. I mean, the railroad workers strike and how they their back was broken is a prime and recent example of why if we don't fight for a new party for working people. And if we pretend that it doesn't matter that there's the Democrats or Republicans, then uh, what we end up having is a leadership of a labor movement that is completely unable to stand up for workers. And that's why I don't think our appeals should go to the leadership. I think that workers who are watching this, rank and file workers who are watching this, we ourselves need to be able to do this. And I mean, of course, the reason that Sean O'Brien felt pressured, I think, to say or an I next yeah. to your name is because they had a recent poll of Teamsters members and a 5% of Teamster members have expressed support for RFK Jr. And I mean, you know, you talked about this in a recent episode, uh, but I mean, he's no alternative for working people either. I mean, first of all, that he started his run inside the Democratic Party. He's totally like part of the establishment um, that he has expressed. I mean, he's part of the Kennedy family. I mean, how, is, how yeah. much more insider can you get? Nepo baby, I think that's what the kids yeah, call it. Exactly. Um, but, um, and he said that he shares the position of both major candidates on continuing the war on Gaza. Um, you can be certain that he would stand with the political establishment on the, the rail strike. I mean, in what fundamental way are those three candidates? candidates different on these key issues that impact millions of working class people and youth. Exactly. This, the whole RFK Jr.'s independent candidacy is extremely confused. It's presented as an extremely confusing thing for working people. And in fact, that's why it is so important that Worker Strike Back has been very clear from day one that what we need is to build the left anti-war pro-worker movement. And we do have a candidate who's an independent, who's on the left, who's anti-war and who's pro-worker, you know, Jill Stein. And she is going to be on the ballot in most, in fact, maybe even all states. 
And in fact, they are right now the campaign is uh, pushing back against just attack after attack from the Democratic Party. Which Something is else that the D uh, Democrats and the Republicans agree on is they trying on. to keep uh, progressive candidates off the ballot. Exactly. Yes. The Teamsters and the GOP may not agree on many issues, but a growing group has shown the courage to sit down and consider points of view that aren't funded by big money think tanks. Senators like J.D. Vance, Roger Marshall, and Representatives Nicole Maliotakis, Mike Lawler, and Brian Fitzpatrick are among elected officials who truly care about working people. And this group is expanding and is putting fear into those who have monopolized our very broken system in America today. <laughs> need a vomit bag? Yeah. I mean... How shocking. Uh, I mean, J.D. Vance, I think people have been following for quite some time uh, because, you know, he put out this this book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, that became a movie. And you read you read that book? Uh, I, I watched the movie. Um, but because my mom told me, like, oh, I watched that and I found it really moving. And I think, you know, what, what did resonate with, with my mom, with ordinary working people, is that Working class people don't see their stories reflected in Hollywood very often um, where, you know, someone who is impoverished is struggling to buy groceries, who, you know, gets uh, tied up in being addicted to opiates. Yeah. And um, especially workers in the South, working class people in the South, you know, there's hardly any positive portrayal yeah, of and, the struggles there. But, I mean, of course, this story is one that's been sold. I mean, it's kind of a Reaganomic story, right? The sort of, like, bootstraps ideology of you can rescue yourself. But how is that an answer for the millions of ordinary people who Absolutely. are living in those conditions? Um, so, I mean, yeah, he's, he's kind of cultivated this image of himself as, like, being from the working class. But, I mean, he's as much a working class figure as um, Clarence Thomas is, like, a fighter for the black community, right? It's exactly. Like, <laughs> exactly. I mean, this guy, uh, Vance, his, he won his senatorial race in 2022 uh, because, first of all, his, he had to win the primary. And uh, this uh, PayPal billionaire, Peter Thiel, spent $10 million to make Vance the senator. So in other words, he's literally bankrolled by a billionaire. And so much for his whole story of struggle in the South. And, it, and you're totally right, it is presenting this Reaganomics, rags to riches story of you know, individualistic achievement, which is actually uh, insidious and poisonous because it, the purpose of that story is not to uh, show respect to working people who are struggling through uh, all kinds of miseries, but yet holding their head up high and have enormous self-respect, which is actually the truth about working class people the world over. But the purpose of this story is to peddle the Reaganomics idea, which is you need to pull yourself up with your bootstraps. And I mean, what I've heard from uh, people talking about the book is the thing that they cut out of the book and didn't make it into the movie is just his absolute disdain for the working class people around him that just sort of drips in the entire book. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned Peter Thiel. Um, not only was he sort of famous for helping um, launch PayPal, but now he's the CEO of Palantir, which is, you know, making big bucks off of the genocidal war in Gaza. Um, so it sort of, again, goes to show this idea that all of these um, billionaires are profiting off of both um, uh, big business parties. Exactly. And, um, and it's even more dangerous, right? I mean, not only is he a vehicle for the billionaire agenda, Vance and Trump, all these guys are vehicles for the billionaire agenda as much as Biden and the Democrats are. But it's also really dangerous in other ways as well, right? I mean, you know, Vance claims to be inspired by this deeply dangerous and frightening ideology, something called dark enlightenment, which is really hearkening back to monarchy and slavery. I mean, it's really, you have to read it to believe it. It's completely a dangerous idea. And... To go down that road itself is, is just uh, really scary. And then if you look at the public interviews that Vance has done, he, he has implied that women who are stuck in violent relationships should not divorce their husbands. And uh, also talked about how black people are inherently inferior to white people. I mean, this is just grotesque. Absolutely. And I mean, 
for Sean O'Brien in that clip to say that these are people who are not funded by hedge funds and think tanks just goes completely against the facts. Um, I mean, you spoke about Peter Thiel, and then there's the recent announcement this week where it came out into the open, though people have been speculating this for weeks, that Elon Musk is spending $45 million a month on uh, Trump super PACs. And, you know, so it's like these are people who are backed by hedge funds, by billionaires, exactly. by some of the most hated billionaires yeah. in the country. And Elon Musk is openly anti-union. I think the moral of the Sean O'Brien at the RNC story is the exact same moral that you derive from the AOC selling out working people by being a shill for Biden story, which is that working people need our own party that is independent of the Republicans and Democrats, independent of the corporate politicians, of the billionaire interests, and a political organ that is fighting for us, a political party that is rooted in mass movements. It's not just an electoral machine to run candidates, ca candidates who, who are running just to make their own careers, but so are socialist or working class in name, but a party that is genuinely running in favor of working people and is accountable to working people. And as a step, as we've said before on this show, as a step towards that, it is important that working people this year fight for the largest possible vote for Jill Stein, who is the most viable left anti-war pro-worker candidate. And alongside that, we also have to keep in mind that as hard as that project is, and it, it will be hard, and, but it's also necessary, but it won't be enough. We can see from the, the from all everything that we talked about today, Emily shows that under capitalism, this is what's on offer. All these people at the top who are ready to uh, have working people sacrifice their every last dime in order to line the pockets of the rich and powerful, and so it can't stop by just building a party. As hard as it will be, we will need to fight for a different kind of system altogether. Capitalism is not going to work for working people. It's never going to work. It doesn't work. It's not going to work to end the climate crisis. We are going to need a different system. And in our view, that system is socialism, a system that is actually owned and where the economy is owned and run by working people. Yeah, I mean, there's um, a certain kind of internationalism being discussed right now where people who are genuinely and rightly afraid of Donald Trump winning, which, I mean, appears to be the most likely case at this moment. We can't say definitively, but, um, you know, and they say, oh, well, I'll go somewhere else. But, I mean, the mm -hmm. story is happening everywhere uh, where the far right is uh, on the march. Um, but there is, I think, an opening for left politics to grow, to Absolutely. be organized. But they also can't sell out working people. And so like, as you were saying, it can't be on the basis of capitalism. That system has to be torn out root and branch um, because if you are sort of an outsider party with left progressive politics, but you accept the limitations of capitalism, it's gonna force no. you to betray workers. Exactly, and, and, and to your point, Emily, the only reason that we were able to win the kind of victories we won in our 10 years in office in Seattle as a socialist was not because we were socialist in name, but then we were trying to make deals with the Democrats because we feel that, oh, well, capitalism is the system, so we just have to somehow compromise. Instead, it is precisely because we are socialist revolutionaries and because of our clarity that this system doesn't work, that we understood that our role as a city council office was not to go there and make peace with the Democrats and administer the city, but instead go there as the disruptor of politics as usual, of business as usual. And use it to organize working class people exactly. and give them confidence, um, which, I mean, brings me to exactly what we're doing this weekend, right? Uh, and I hope people will join us um, and come out uh, this Sunday, the 21st, uh, for Worker Strike Back's inaugural Zoom conference. I think it's going to be an exciting conversation about how we can actually build an alternative to Trump and Biden um, and, you know, decide on what strategy working class people and youth should take. Um, so hopefully people will become a member of worker strike back so they can vote in that conference. I think those kinds of democratic structures are so important for us to be building. And, you know, beyond uh, the, the event on Sunday, of course, also joining us in Chicago uh, on August 19th uh, for the protests outside of the DNC, which will be sort of a jumping off point uh, to continue to build this momentum uh, alongside the movements who've been demanding an actual alternative, a real worker uh, alternative, not this prison of lesser evilism. So hopefully we'll see all of you there on Sunday. Um, don't forget to register. The link is in the bio. Solidarity.